Our climate is changing. The world is warming. Sea levels are rising faster than ever. And extreme weather is becoming more frequent and more intense. The science is clear. Human actions are to blame. Climate change is the defining crisis of our time. We are in a climate emergency. I spent most of my career trying to measure the climate impacts of our actions in the hopes that governments can identify the best policies or businesses can find the right strategies to help us slow the damage. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world learned to produce everything faster and cheaper. As societies got richer, we produced more and consumed more energy, more materials, and more food. What we need is a new industrial revolution, a new playbook that decouples growth from emissions. That revolution is gaining momentum. Energy powers our economies. But energy is responsible for 80% of all greenhouse gases produced, the key culprit behind our warming planet. How do we slow down those emissions? One way is to electrify and to power that electrification with clean energy. Solar is one of the cheapest and most accessible sources of energy on Earth. But when land is scarce, like in Singapore, engineers need to get creative. This solar farm floats on one of the city's reservoirs. We built a 60 megawatt peak system that can actually power up 16,000 HDB flats. That translates to 32 kilotons of carbon emission offsets that we can produce. That's enough to power Singapore's five local water treatment plants, making Singapore one of the few countries in the world to have a 100% green waterwork system. SEMCORP took a little under a year to build this, one of the world's largest floating solar farms. They're now ready to apply the same idea on waters elsewhere. We have a target of 10 gigawatts. With all the lessons and innovations that we have learned, we want to work with the neighboring countries to develop renewable energy together with them. There's even more good news. Apart from having solar panels float on water, Researchers are already studying how they could be pasted on the glass or skins of buildings, or on cars, buses, or almost anything. All of this could give solar farms a bigger footprint. But the biggest drawback about solar is that it can't always be on. New research on other renewable sources could help, like geothermal energy. The most common way to harvest geothermal energy is by drilling a well deep underground, then piping the heat up to power a turbine, which generates electricity for a grid. But exploration to find hot fluids underground are an expensive and time-consuming process with no guaranteed results. EVER wants to make geothermal energy much more accessible and scalable. They use a series of multilateral well bores called an Everloop. Fluid is circulated through the Everloop, which is then naturally heated by the earth through conduction. When the hot working fluid reaches the surface, the heat picked up underground can be used to generate electricity. It's a reliable and consistent energy source, and it can be deployed anywhere, especially near cities. It changes the entire process from one of exploration to something that's a repeatable manufacturing process, something that's scalable. And that makes all the difference in the world. They're all underground, very low structures. So the beauty of this thing, you can fit it anywhere and you don't have to look at it and land can still be used for recreation or agriculture or whatever else you want. So that is a huge win-win. Making the transition to this new energy source requires construction and professional expertise. That kind of talent is already available in the oil and gas industry. They don't need any retraining. So all of a sudden you're an oil and gas guy, you're sitting there, oh, actually I am for you know, the green revolution because I know I can still earn a living doing that. I can still feed my kids. People can redeploy their existing skills 
on this whole new green industry that has so many other advantages. There's another source of renewable energy that's been around much longer, nuclear. Nuclear fission makes up 10% of the world's energy mix, the highest among all low carbon sources. But nuclear's reputation precedes it. Research is underway on a safer type of reaction, nuclear fusion. The word nuclear has a bad reputation as long, long-lasting waste and the, the problems of Fukushima and Chernobyl. But fusion is a different thing. It's a different process. It has very different radiological hazards, and it should be treated as a different source of power. This is how fusion energy is created. Fusion fuel is a hot gas of two heavy forms of hydrogen, which are fused to form helium. In the process, some of their leftover mass is turned into energy. One of the beauties of fusion is that it is so energy intensive. This is really the holy grail in a sense, that you've effectively got inexhaustible fuel, um, and yet it could supply electricity for all of us continuously and in a carbon-free way. Um, but it's really hard to do because you're dealing with a fuel which is so hot, and so sustaining that temperature and holding the fuel in a stationary way is then a big challenge. Fusion reactors are difficult to make because they must withstand temperatures of up to 150 million degrees Celsius, 10 times hotter than the sun. The kind of heat needed to fuse atoms melts most machines. ITER at the south of France is the world's most expensive science experiment designed to achieve fusion at scale. The UK's Atomic Energy Authority are members of the ITER project but they're also building a much smaller reactor. Scaling down makes commercialization easier. ITER is big and it is quite expensive. And if the power plants that follow ITER, you have to raise sort of $20 billion each time you want to build a power station, that's quite hard to do. And so you also want to find ways of making it more economically attractive. And that could be making it smaller, drive down the scale. People have got to want to buy it. If it's too expensive, people won't buy it. And then people have got to want it and accept it and understand it and be in favor of it. All of those things have to happen for that ecosystem to really work. A movement to decarbonize is underway and not just in industrial settings. As the world seeks new ways to harvest clean power, efforts are already underway to help us use energy more efficiently. In Singapore, air conditioning is quite the necessity to beat the heat but cooling accounts for much of the city's energy usage. In homes, it makes up almost 30% of energy bills, and electricity consumption in buildings and households make up about 20% of the country's overall annual carbon emissions. A new approach can make cooling cheaper and more efficient. The city's largest energy provider, SP Group, designed a centralized cooling system for the city's iconic Marina Bay Financial District. It's installing a similar system at a housing estate. Centralized cooling works like this. On rooftops of blocks, water is chilled. Solar panels nearby partially power the refrigeration process. The chilled water is piped to homes, where a fan coil unit creates cool air from the chilled water and cools the apartment. A centralized and professionally managed chiller makes cooling more efficient. Compared to the conventional setup, with many small chiller units placed throughout an apartment block. It will give them at least up to 30% energy efficiency. Energy efficiency should translate into savings for them. Uh, and in the long run, uh, it also enables them to not just save money. The next generation will have a planet which is not destroyed by all this ozone depleting refrigerants, but they're able to stay cool. They're able to have uh, thermal comforts, uh, quality living but at the same time still protect the planet for the next generation. The town has other smart technologies meant to reduce energy, like an app that gives residents a reading of their energy consumption on demand. And you can actually compare that to other households in Singapore. So you can actually know whether you are faring uh, ahead or actually behind the national average and take actions towards that. Renewable energy holds the promise of a sustainable future but it has to go hand in hand with electrification. Heavy transportation like shipping, aviation and trucking are hard to abate. Heavy duty transportation, for example, like marine vessels, aviation, or heavy trucks, that's another story. You can't electrify them directly. You can't plug 
a cable into a marine vessel and make sure that it works on clean power. Since big machines can't be powered by batteries, hydrogen could be the energy carrier instead. Haldor Topso is a Danish company working on developing green hydrogen. That's hydrogen created from renewable energy. They've developed a solid oxide electrolyzer cell, which uses electrical power to split water to produce hydrogen. The electricity comes from renewable sources, making it green hydrogen. No carbon or harmful toxins are emitted from the process. And the electrolyzer cell delivers 30% more hydrogen output compared to other technologies. Hydrogen could then be used to make ammonia, which could power ships. Until recently, it was completely off the charts. You hadn't have this development. But now, more and more, there is a tremendous awareness coming in these kinds of sectors to generate more and more clean power for transportation. Just like what happened with solar and wind. 20, 25 years ago, it was extremely expensive to deploy solar parks or windmills. But now, the industry has gone through a learning curve. And I am absolutely convinced that with our technology, we will do the same. In Singapore, the PSA studies these developments closely. It operates Singapore's container port, the largest transshipment hub in the world. Besides hydrogen, there are alternatives that we can actually explore using. Ammonia, organic hydride, uh, among other hydrogen vectors that we can use. Using hydrogen in its pure, purest form or in other vectors whereby hydrogen is stored in other compounds. So if we can use all those uh, uh, fuels directly, then it actually reduce the um, energy that's needed to create them and also improve the um, cost outcome. Singapore is in a unique leadership position. We are the global leading bunkering hub. So we have to be stewards for the maritime industry and also the global supply chain. So whatever we are doing is really to not just reinforce our current status, but also to then elevate us, propelling us to not just a global leader in supply chain, but one that takes the lead in sustainability outcomes. Another source of sustainable liquid fuel has already been commercialized. The challenge now is to achieve greater adoption. At Nest Day, a variety of wastes and residues such as used cooking oil and animal fats from fruit processing waste arriving from the region are processed into renewable diesel and other renewable products. The fuel, known as Nest Day My Renewable Diesel, is a drop-in solution, so it's fully compatible with diesel engines. It can be blended with normal diesel or used neat. According to Nest Day's calculations, Based on the EU Renewable Energy Directive, its renewable diesel releases 90% less greenhouse gas emissions over the fuel's life cycle compared to fossil diesel. Here's why. Emissions from fossil fuels don't circulate because the carbon bound in oil or coal has been out of circulation for millions of years. And the emissions are considered additional when released into the atmosphere. And that's why it speeds up climate change. On the other hand, Nest Day My Renewable Diesel is made largely from waste and residues, including those from vegetable oil processing and used cooking oil. Renewable raw materials during their lifetimes soak up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. When renewable diesel is burned, it releases CO2, but what is returned to the atmosphere is equal to the amount absorbed by the plants earlier, so CO2 is circulated. Even in a pandemic environment, there is about 800 million tons of diesel being consumed on the planet every year. And that is expected to rebound again to 900 million tons. 70% of that is heavy duty transportation. If we would even achieve 50% electrification in road transportation, let's say by 2030, well, there is still 400 million tons of fossil based diesel being consumed in the world. So that means that our renewable diesel still has a huge opportunity to help decarbonize and replace that fossil-based diesel. Nest Day also produces sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF as it is commonly known. SAF, used NEAT, helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions over the fuel's life cycle by up to 80% compared to fossil jet fuel.
300 million tons of fossil-based jet fuel was used on average before the pandemic. Because of the sheer volume of flights worldwide, the carbon cutting potential is massive. But SAF doesn't come cheap. It's currently three to five times more expensive than conventional jet fuel. The higher cost prevents a wider uptake and in turn makes the prospect of scaling up supply difficult. Singapore's national carrier, SIA, first trialed sustainable aviation fuel in 2017 on over three months of flights between Singapore and San Francisco. We saved 320 tons of carbon dioxide. Also, in 2020, we deployed SAF on our flights between Stockholm and Moscow. And we continue to look out for opportunities to deploy sustainable aviation fuel on more flights. The airline aims to steadily increase its use of SAF to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And they're not going at it alone. I think it takes two hands to clap. If we are able to stimulate higher sustainable aviation fuel demand from the travelling public, this would give us a chance to break that vicious cycle and lower the price of sustainable aviation fuel, making it a lot more affordable for everyone to travel sustainably. An energy revolution is gathering momentum. With solutions already in place to enable clean and renewable power to be harvested everywhere. Along with new technologies to make our consumption of energy much more efficient. And new solutions for liquid fuels to decarbonize sectors that are typically hard to abate. The time has come now for humanity to make the switch to a more sustainable energy future.